Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, this session on uh, bridging the gender divide, specifically in the context of the fourth um, industrial revolution. My name's Jason Yetzin Lee uh, from the George Institute for Global Health. Very, very happy to be here, and thank you for joining us. Um, what we're looking at today is um, gender diversity in general, but specifically in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, robotics, artificial intelligence. What does that mean you know, for gender, I guess, in a, in a soundbite? In a world of robots, um, what role does gender have? What role does diversity have? I think we have a uniquely qualified panel um, with us today. I'll just introduce them briefly. Um, we have uh, Sanjeev Chatrath, who's the Managing Director and Regional Head uh, for Asia Financial and Risk from Thomson Reuters. Thank you. We have Professor Pascal Fung, who's the Professor in uh, the Department of Electronics and Computer Engineering from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. We have uh, Joshua Hoffman, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Zymogen uh, from the United States. And we have Lindawe Mazbuku, who's the leader of the opposition in the Parliament of uh, South Africa. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Where we might uh, start, I think, in setting the scene, um, I'm just putting a slide up for everybody to see. This um, shows how long it will take to uh, achieve um, sort of economic um, gender parity, to closing the economic uh, gender gap. And there's some very big years, there's some 360 uh, years um, in, the, in the worst case in terms of closing um, that gap. I'll just put that up there for context. Where we might start is I might go to the panel and just, as introductory remarks, ask everybody to let me make some comments about what is the status of gender equality, gender parity in um, their neck of the woods in their particular um, industry and in, in parts of the world. I might start with you, Josh. Do you want to kick us off? Uh, thanks. Um, so I'm the CEO of, a, of a, maybe a prototypical fourth industrial revolution company that integrates uh, AI, automation, uh, and biotechnology. And as a company, a technology company that's based in the Bay Area, uh, there's kind of good news and bad news when it comes to gender. Uh, the bad news is that generally uh, tech companies do a bad job uh, in recruiting women and creating uh, environments uh, that are attractive for women to work in. And that's been in the press a ton recently. Um, I mean, whether it's Uber or even struggles that Google and Facebook and others have had uh, recruiting female engineers. So that's the bad news. Uh, I think the good news is that there does feel like a change in the last year or two. This is a real recognition that this is a problem, uh, that this is unacceptable, that this is a waste of talent and opportunity. Uh, and if I think about us, and I think this, this will hold broadly for other companies that are integrating uh, technologies, uh, having a diverse workforce, and by diverse I mean uh, intellectually diverse workforce, people that think about the problem differently, uh, that's a critical part of what I think is going to differentiate winners and losers, right? And so I think it's, it is an imperative for us and I think for, for other companies to try and create an environment in which gender diversity is one of many kinds of diversity. Thank you. Sanjeev, do you want to give us your... Um, view on, on what's happening in your neck of the woods, and I guess also from a from a large organisational you know perspective as well. Sure, Jason, very happy to. So, so I, you, you had a slide earlier that you put up in terms of the pace of change that's going on, um, and I've I've got another slide which, uh, if you don't mind bringing up, uh, this is a slide that demonstrates uh, the kind of progress that seems to be made, but also the impact that uh, that is being had in the world, uh, and what you'll see over here is that. Uh, we, because we are a data and information company, we obviously uh, track a lot of data around the world. Increasingly, we are seeing growing amount of demand from investors, asset managers, to be able to better understand how diverse and inclusive companies are performing. And over a period of time, uh, while there is a lot of conversations around the fact that diverse companies outperform their peer groups in terms of profit margins, return on equities, or top-line performance, what you'll also see as evidence over here is that diverse companies outperforms all the benchmarks, and increasingly we are seeing growing amount of demand from asset managers and investors who are looking for those opportunities because they see this as a secular trend which will help them to outperform and generate more alpha for their businesses. 
the first slide that you had, obviously it's very, very discouraging, uh, just when you think about the, the, the state of play right now in the world. Uh, and I have looked at studies which refer to the fact that in aggregate it will take almost 170 years to reach gender parity. Uh, what is perhaps even more discouraging is that when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, uh, there is a very real risk that we'll actually regress as opposed to making progress from creating more diverse workplace. And there are, again, statistics around that for male-dominated sectors. Every time a job gets automated, it probably takes out three traditional jobs. Whereas for female-dominated sectors, every time a new job is created, it takes out five uh, traditional jobs. So if we didn't do anything, if we did not intervene, and if we are not trying to, to help address this challenge, it is only going to get worse. So I'll, I'll leave that a little bit on a sobering note because I think the need for intervention is very, very real, and it's really up to all of us uh, to engage, to be able to generate that kind of return that I, I showed in the first slide. Thanks, Sanjay. If we might unpack that a little bit more um, later, I'm interested in a big organisational perspective. You know, if, if everything is going to be taken over by artificial intelligence, particularly in the information age, then, you know, what is the relevance of gender for you guys? We can unpack that a bit more later on. Sure. So, women in leadership positions, um, so as a parliamentarian and a leading parliamentarian in South Africa, can you give us some insights as to where you think in the political realm, you know, the status of gender equality, gender parity is? Yeah, but I'd like to start by painting as quick a picture as I can of what the status of gender, the, the road towards gender parity in Africa and in South Africa specifically is. Um, it's characterized by deep inequality. There's a very profound kind of elite recognition in Africa and in South Africa too about the critical importance of making sure that there is adequate gender uh, diversity in terms of leadership, in politics, in business, in government. The bench is packed with female judges. Parliament is almost 50% uh, made up of women. That's quite a big trend across Africa. Rwanda, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is the most gender equal parliament in the world. Um, and so there's a lot of progress happening at the very kind of elite, high, high level. It does not trickle down in any way to the ordinary African woman's daily experience. African women are disproportionately exposed to the negative consequences of disease burden, of economic dispossession, of lack of access to education, of cultural practices that hold them back. Um, and as much as there's a lot of back patting that goes on in Africa, um, and you know, I, you know, I've been guilty of that too in the past. Um, you know, whenever we have a female president elected, female opposition leaders in parliament, female cabinet ministers, and so forth, we don't spend enough time having a conversation about why um, the economics of that, you know, transformation aren't taking place at a, at a higher level. And I think in Africa, that challenge is is made worse by the challenge of um, the fact that we're a very young continent. You know, the average age in Africa is 19 years old. So in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, it's not only a question of how women will be brought into the formal economy through work opportunities, but it's also how young women and young people who up until now haven't been adequately prepared for a world of work that's changing, that's increasingly knowledge-based and not uh, you know, in the old traditional industrial mold. Um, what are we going to do to make sure that this challenge doesn't get away from us, um, that we don't find ourselves deeper entrenched in the inequalities of women being denied economic opportunities, and especially young women being denied those opportunities um, as we march towards automation? I'm very interested in your comment that you know, there is a lot of gender diversity within the parliament, mm -hmm. but it's not flowing through to what's actually happening on the ground. Mm. Can you just quickly give us a view, you know, why is that? Is it, is it a failure of practical solutions? Is it, is it you know, what, what's, what's just quickly behind that? I mean, primarily it's an economic challenge. Um, you know, South Africa, you know, competes with Brazil regularly for the most unequal country on earth. Um, the Gini coefficient in both countries is out of control, and that economic, um, that economic aspect of inequality is, is further you know, exacerbated by the gender division. So if you are a middle class, highly educated, very successful woman who has had, had, had access to um, training, skills, development, and so forth, and crucially, if you're part of the political elite in South Africa, there's a recognition and understanding of the necessity for gender equality and there are opportunities for you to move through that system. 
But what South Africa hasn't quite yet, through, you know, through a series of policy failures, through a consequence of apartheid and colonialism, our history of division, racial and otherwise, what South Africa hasn't quite yet addressed is the question of just getting young people, getting women, getting the poor into jobs. We have the biggest welfare state on the continent, yeah. uh, which is a crucial part of keeping the poorest people, you know, um, living lives of dignity on a daily basis, but isn't enough to address the challenge of how to bring more people who, who lack the quality, education, and skills necessary to enter the formal economy, um, how to bring those people into the system. So I think those challenges exist for the, the, the population as, as a whole, but they're exacerbated for women and they're exacerbated for young people. And if you are, you know, the average South African, because women are the majority, and yeah. the average age is 24, yeah. so the average South African is a young woman. If you are an average South African, your access to economic uh, opportunities, you know, the likelihood of prosperity, and in addition to that, the burden of disease, social and cultural norms that limit you is quite heavy. And there really has been a leadership failure um, on the part of you know, senior elite leaders in business, government, and society to, to close that gap. Um, and so the time, you know, the fourth industrial revolution is bringing an urgency to that conversation, um, which hopefully will accelerate efforts to bring the benefits of gender parity uh, to ordinary South Africans and Africans. Thank you very much. I'd like to um, throw it to Pascal now. Would you like to give us your um, views, both within your area of work and, but I, I guess, personally as well in, in, in your field? So, um, so I will, I'm a, a researcher in artificial intelligence for about 30 years, so I would like to talk about that. Um, in the earlier panel, I mentioned uh, the AI divide, which, uh, which is dividing, which is the divide between those who uh, control AI technology, those who don't and uh, those who are knowledgeable developers, uh, who are AI practitioners, and those who are consumers. And also the divide between genders. As today's consumers are actually majority uh, women, and, but the developers, the engineers who develop these technologies for us to consume are majority men. So I'm also, uh, I'm an educator and entrepreneur, and I have been very concerned with the fact that in our field of computer science, electrical engineering, which is the field of uh, where AI is drawn from, that there has been a, a decrease in terms of enrollment, uh, women enrollment into computer science worldwide. 20 years ago, um, there were more women uh, in terms of percentage into coming into computer science. Today, um, the best top universities might be able to attract more women, but overall, the, uh, the trend is uh, actually is going down. Uh, similarly, for electrical engineering, I've been at the university for over 20 years, and then the percentage, we've always had 10% women, and it's increasing slightly and then dropped it back down again. So um, it has always bothered me that we were not able to attract more women into these fields. So these are the most, so among STEM fields, these are the two fields, computer science, electrical engineering, where there's the lowest uh, female representation. And that has a big um, impact on AI because that's what AI is. So, and AI is a technology that, it's the disruptive technology that's gonna change our lives in, all, all, in many, many ways. And uh, unlike previous technologies, AI is this technology that, um, that's uh, of primary concern to us because it focuses on human applications. It does things for us. And we're even talking about replacing humans. So unlike other previous generations of technologies like the steam engine or the electricity, AI has a lot more humanistic um, um, implications for us. And at the same time, AI has uh, spawned a um, huge opportunity, economic opportunity, for those who control AI technologies, for companies that, can, that are able to innovate and develop AI, and for um, uh, people who have the background who can do startups and they can quickly develop the, their companies into very scalable business models. So then these companies are very successful and become more and more successful. But when you look at these companies, the majority of people there who are benefiting and who are developing, who are participating in this AI economy, I call it the AI economy, who's really participating are uh, overwhelmingly men because the engineers are overwhelmingly men. So that is of, uh, I am very concerned about that because then this, uh, this divide is, uh, is becoming 
quite dire, mm. right? We, we've been talking about STEM education for women for a long time. We've tried try to do, I, I founded, I co-founded the Women Faculty Association at our university about five years ago, and we were trying to uh, improve the recruitment of women faculty. And then and we realized quickly that we have uh, really a leaking pipeline. So we have to work with uh, women students and try to get them into, into engineering field. Is there a solution? Um, I think there is, but that involves a complete overhaul of our engineering education curriculum. Completely overhaul. Um, so I'm teaching, uh, I've been teaching uh, signal processing and speech recognition for almost 20 years, and in the last couple of years, I've changed the course. So I've changed the class from primarily signal processing mathematical models to programming, uh, some programming assignments, to a class where I teach the students actually to build actual AI systems using existing SDKs, existing uh, toolkits, existing open source kits. And they can very quickly come up with applications that they, they, they want to build. And this is today possible. What does this mean? I still teach them the theory behind it, but they can build things. And what does this mean? To me, it means that uh, if we can uh, take advantage, so on one hand, AI is, uh, might, might create this divide. On the other hand, these AI tools is giving us the opportunity to democratize technology. So we can have more people, and in this particular case, I'm thinking about the girls, the young girls, the women, young women, to, be, uh, to participate in this maker culture, in this uh, um, maker culture, in this uh, uh, um, AI um, economy. Um, another story I have is um, uh, of um, my daughters. So I have two young daughters, and the youngest one is nine. And uh, she has been given plenty of opportunities to learn mathematics and programming since she was six. And, uh, and, and, and she said one day to me that, Mama, I actually don't like programming. It's so boring. And I just like, I, I didn't show any expression, OK? And I'm like, oh, why? You're not a tiger mother. No. And then she said, but I like building things. I like building these little robots. And she conceived and designed and built these tiny robots. At the beginning, the tiny robot just came and scratched my feet. And now the tiny robot will have a little, little, some kind of room to clean the floors, tiny. But she loves building stuff that she designed. And she has to, use, she has to program. Okay, so the culture of computer science used to be just about the means, not the objective. What are we using computer science for? And I think, in my experience as an educator, I do see a difference between, uh, the statistical difference between the genders, where the women students are much more interested in making, in, in making technology help people to do things. Right? That's so. great. Thank you, Pascal. I think we've really dived into the implications of the fourth industrial revolution now. And um, to the panelists, jump in at any time. Don't, don't, you, know, don't, you don't have to follow my lead. If you have sort of a point, please just, just point at me. I, I really wanted to unpack some of the things that you, you mentioned here, um, Pascal, around, you know, with artificial intelligence and with the future of work, I guess, certain jobs are going to be disrupted. There'll be a whole lot of new jobs um, created. You had, a, you had an interesting slide here in terms of the sorts of jobs that are going to be destroyed and the sorts of jobs that are going to be created. I mean, is, is there an argument that says in the world of machines and technology, what we will gravitate to as, as people, as, as, as humans, are, are the things that are intrinsically more human, compassion-based, creativity, empathy, etc. And traditionally, you could argue that these are things that, that women are, are, are better at. And right. I could throw this to the channel from a technologist's point of view and, and, and from, a, from, a, from a leadership point of view. Mm -hmm. um, be interested in the panel's thoughts on these, on these things. What, I, I guess what it comes to, is there, what is the net, what do people think will be the net implication of the fourth industrial revolution on, on gender, overall positive or negative? It's very simplistic, but I'm just interested in your views on that. Depends on how we do it. Yeah. If we are mindful and we pay attention to these divides, not just gender divides, other divides, if we're mindful, which I think we are, for those of us who are here discussing this, we are, and we have the leadership who has the same vision. So I was very encouraged by the Premier Li Keqiang's message this morning about uh, inclusivity, about inclusive innovation. And I hope that means also gender inclusive innovation that 
everybody gets involved, um, and, and everybody from different areas get involved in, in creating this economy to the benefit of uh, everyone also. So I think we have to be mindful, and if we are, and we keep at it, then it will be have a, we will have a very different outcome as to, compared to if we, we were not mindful. So, so Jason, I wanted to add and build upon something that Pascal and earlier Lindvig also mentioned, that I think clearly there is a lot of potential, there's a lot of opportunities. But I think we've got to be also careful that we don't oversimplify the enormity of the challenge that's in yeah. front of us. Because I think that is the mistake we have made as mankind for a number of years, and hence we are in the state that we are in. Uh, and time tells us, if you look back to history, that every time there has been any kind of revolution, any kind of change like this fourth industrial revolution, it is primarily used by those in power and positions of influence to maximize their ability to have a greater impact. Mm -hmm. And I worry that I think if there wasn't an intervention, if there wasn't a deliberate action, the outcome is not necessarily going to be any better. So, I mean, having said that, uh, I'm still very optimistic that this fourth industrial revolution does present a lot of opportunities for us to collectively come together and actually address a lot of these challenges that have always existed. And I, I can share with you a few examples. You asked earlier about give, give a context of a large organization. So as, as you know, Thomson Reuters is perhaps one of the, the first fintech companies in the world. We've been around for 160 years. We process about a petabyte of data every single day. Uh, and we, we obviously are deep, deep, deep into the data. Uh, the commitment that the company has got is actually second to none. And with the result now, for eight years running, we are rated as one of the most admired companies in the world but also one of the, the most uh, uh, aspired companies for women to work at. And that has been possible because of deliberate actions, and that starts with the tone at the top. So our CEO chairs a women's uh, action task force. Uh, that's the level of commitment. Uh, you have to make some visible commitments, and I'll, I'll, I'll make uh, two categories of it, things that we can individually as leaders and institutions do, and things that perhaps do require government, NGOs, public-private partnerships to be able to address. In the first bucket, you will have things like visible commitments. Uh, we publicly reported that we are going to move to 40% senior management representation within the next three years. We are already one of the more advanced in the technology field, similar to Josh. We've got 30% senior representation of women in our organization, and we have committed to get to 40% by 2020. Uh, I also see, similarly, a lot of momentum gaining uh, in the industry. So I'm part of the 30% club in Hong Kong, where if you think about board representations, Hong Kong significantly lags behind most of the peer groups in the world. We've only got give and take about 12% board rep representation that are women. And we are working very hard at 30% club to make that a, a topic of focus. And we're committed to get to at least, no company should have zero female representation by next year. Uh, there's still 11 companies in Hong Kong exchange that don't have any women representation at all. Now think about this is Hong Kong. This is not a, a, a very remote emerging market. Uh, and similarly, I'll say with regards to what I can do and companies can do is to engage from a gender point of view that this is not just a woman's issue. If we look at the context, if anywhere between 10 to 20 percent only of the representation in many of these sectors is women, 80 to 90 percent of the, the influence is with the men. So we've now formed a male allies, uh, which is a cross-industry partnership where we've got now 30 senior C-suite people in Hong Kong come together making personal commitments on what can they do to improve the representation of women uh, at every level within the organization. So I'll say that from the perspective of what we individually can do and, and from an industry point of view, but there's also a lot that needs to be done to leverage technology. I think the point that was made earlier with, with the South Africa example because technology can actually be a great enabler. A lot of the societal barriers that have existed have been traditionally very adverse to women representation and workforce. Mm -hmm. So you think about safety, you think about security, you think about transportation, you think about productivity of time, where a lot of their time and energy is spent in, in attending to societal compulsions along with the work compulsions. Technology has the potential to be able to address that. And the last one I'll say is we absolutely have to transform education. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll echo Pascal's sentiments to it. And we have to make education systems more future ready to be able to, to generate lifelong learning as opposed to, if you think about a lifespan of an individual, we front load learning in the first 20 years of an individual and then we kind of expect them to operate like that. But the future of workflow, workplace, as you were alluding to, 
is going to perhaps require people to have skills that they continue to train and retrain throughout their career. And I think that, again, is a big area of focus and an opportunity for us to ensure that we get better representation in those sectors where you do not have appropriate representation from women. Thank you. Josh, can we any... Yeah, I mean, from the policy perspective, the, the question of lifelong learning um, is an incredibly powerful one because, you know, in a, in a continent, in a country like ours, where many people have been left behind um, by a legacy of exclusion, um, it becomes possible to find ways to, you know, to bring those who've been left out of the formal economy in, into, um, into the system if we don't think only about education as something that's front-loaded at the beginning. But I mean, one of the challenges we face as, as policymakers in Africa is, is that sort of we're trapped in a very old way of thinking about education, thinking about the world of work, thinking about skills development. Um, and we have yet to modernize our, the framework with which we think about these things. And it goes back to the challenge I, I stated earlier, which is the, you know, the age, the, the dominance of young people in Africa's population is not reflected in its leadership. So we have leaders who were actually still in government during the Cold War, who were around you know, during the you know, industrial, industrial boom on the continent, who feel that they can avoid the fourth industrial revolution, who feel like it's a choice that they can make. They can opt in or opt out. Yeah. Robots won't affect us, it's not our problem. Uh, we're gonna focus on mining, we're gonna focus on commodities, we're gonna focus on the things we know best. Uh, and we're gonna focus on building cars and so forth, smokestacks. Um, industry. Um, there's a sense among a lot of African policymakers that this is an active choice that you can make to participate in this new economy or not. And the, the, the people who are really going to suffer as a consequence of, of this lack of imag imagination and policymaking are young Africans and particularly young women in Africa. Um, so there's a, there's a suite of policy challenges that require first an acknowledgement of the problem at hand, an acknowledgement of the wave of unemployment that will hit the continent unless we are able to prepare women, young people, Africans for the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and that requires, uh, that requires leadership. Which will mean a, a large amount of political disruption as well if there is that rise in unemployment and you know, social dislocation. Well, there's always this threat of social unrest. And you know, in, in South Africa, we have just come out of two, and you know, we're going to go into the third year now, probably, of student protests, university students, who represent the most elite young people in terms of having access to education, access to higher education. Students protesting about how high university fees are and how unable they are to, um, to feed themselves, to buy books, to participate in class the way they should be able to. Um, but that student protest is also a product of young people graduating university and not being able to find work because a lot of young Africans are being trained with skills that are becoming obsolete as they yep. move into the economy. And so that is a small example, in South Africa at least, of the danger of not preparing uh, women, of not preparing a young African population uh, for the rigors of the fourth industrial revolution, and of not embedding the principle of lifelong learning, um, and of learning that doesn't just take place at the beginning of your life, but is, 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 is augmented throughout the, the course of your working life. The dangers of not you know, embedding that in policy making will become evident unless we start to address that issue. Yeah. I wanted to get Josh's view on something and, and to, to anything that's been said here, but we've been talking just about learning. And I mean, I'm not a technologist, you know, from a, from a, maybe from a technology perspective, this, this notion of, of deep learning that underpins a lot of the artificial intelligence, that, to my limited understanding, draws on what's happened in the past, you know, past patterns of behaviour. And when we're just talking about, look, we need to do things very, very differently, do you think that there's a risk that through, because of the process of deep learning, we're going to entrench certain biases um, in that? Or how do we, how do we, how do we break that um, in the context of, of the technology? So one minor technical digression, and I'm sure Pascal will appreciate this. Deep learning gets tons of press. And deep learning is a very powerful set of machine learning techniques. Uh, but deep learning is not the be all and end all. And at least for us, for a bunch of, again, really geeky technical reasons I won't get into, we probably use deep learning less uh, than other AI companies, it, having to do with how much data there is. So I think, I think it's, uh, it's important to recognize that while there are things like deep learning where um, the it's hard to break out of the context of the data set. There are lots of kinds of research done on techniques that allow you to bring AI to bear where you don't have as much history. 
Um, that said, I think the, the bigger point, and it's brought up here, is that if you're gonna be in a fourth industrial revolution context, even as a company, you have to be able to learn, you have to be able to, one of the most important things for people we hire is the ability to understand, nobody's ever built a company like the one we're building. And that means that whatever context you've been in before, it, you can't take the lessons directly from that, right? So that's the, that's the human analogy to the deep learning point you're making. And so you have to select for people that have the ability to say, in my previous context, A and B and C worked, I recognize that this context is different, A still holds, B holds, if I adjust it, C doesn't work at all. Um, and because that kind of learning and awareness of context is frankly hard for most of us because we're pattern spotters, uh, it's another reason why we at least care so much about having uh, intellectually diverse workforce or workforce that can think about things from different perspectives because then you externalize that, that dissonance around the context, right? So I say, oh, it's like this, and somebody else says, no, it's not. And, and then you, you force the conversation about the context out and that's a place where all sorts of diversity, again, including but not limited to gender diversity, is massively important. Thank you. We're going to start opening it up to the audience. Um, now, if anybody has any sort of comments or um, questions in particular uh, to the, uh, the panellists, um, please raise your hand and when I can see you, I'll, I'll, I'll throw to you. Um, just as you're thinking about um, that, I'd like to move things now a little bit to, you know, solutions. Um, you know, what we can, you know, what we can do. I think we've unpacked the issue and the problems uh, a bit now. And let's move to, you know, some of the, some of the solutions um, around this. Um, any of you have a particular view about, you know, the most important things that, you know, we need to change um, around how we're doing things now? Well, I did mention about overhauling the education uh, system. The, the, the curriculum for engineering education, especially in AI robotics, and uh, that uh, to attract more women to participate in creating technology that we use. Um, I have a very interesting anecdote. Um, I walked into, so for all my life, I've been in a very male-dominated field. And uh, one day I walked into the meeting about uh, building a, um, human robot interactions. So it was a meeting, it's a project meeting to build social robots. Okay, those little robots you can have at home, you can talk to it, it can help you to do different things. Or like robots that can help you in healthcare, take care of old elderly people. I walked in the room of that meeting and I just noticed something was off and I couldn't figure out what it was. And then halfway through the meeting I realized it was majority women. And this rarely happens to me. So I realized that even in robotics and AI, there is some kind of a gender divide. Even, even deep learning, there's gender divide. There, it's not the methodologies we're using that are different. We use the same models, same tools, uh, we have the same training, but it's the issues, the applications we care about. You see these male robotists who create beautiful androids to look like the fantasy girlfriends, maybe? Uh, you don't see women doing that. And all, if you look at the field of social robotics, it's almost, almost always women that, who are creating these robots with emotion recognition, with empathy, that's my field, and with, uh, with uh, you know, intent recognition, how to help the elderly, help the sick. So I know I'm stereotyping, but this is empirical evidence. So I think if we all participate together, uh, if both genders can participate together, I, there's value in both. There's value in being single-mindedly focusing on improving technology. I used to be like that until recent years. Uh, there's a value in that to be single, um, to be focused uh, only on the tech. And of course, there's value in looking at beyond that and at the impact of the tech. And for us to work together, that's how we can build technologies and AI in particular that will help us rather than harm us. So uh, I think uh, the solution, as I mentioned earlier, is the, to in, encourage the maker culture, I mean, both in terms of software and, and hardware. So people keep talking about um, coding. Um, I want to say that coding is, is, is a means to an end. I think we need to appeal to our young women about the end, so what they can use coding to do. Not just coding as a job, it's a, every, you know, in the future, programming, software programming is gonna be a job in demand because we have so many machines to program. But I do not think that particularly appeals to uh, most of the young women um, that I have uh, been in contact with. But what appeals to them 
is to uh, influence the world in a positive way. Um, in uh, traditional female disciplines such as nursing, healthcare, uh, even medicine, you know, med majority of our medical doctors are women. In tr these traditionally female uh, disciplines, actually we don't see a very, um, so the robots are not gonna replace those because they're so centered around taking care of humans. The robots cannot replace those jobs anytime soon. So the women have to, uh, will naturally play a bigger role and uh, I would like them to participate in making robots and AI technology that will help us. And uh, I, I would like to send that message. I would like all of you to go back and tell the women and girls that um, they should come into computer science, electrical engineering. Thank you. So, so, so Pascal has shared a couple of stories, and, and I've got a story of my own also that I would love to share. Uh, and, and this is a story of my mom. So she was a working woman in the 1960s in India. And when I just think about the challenges a lot of time modern day women have to face, I can't even begin to imagine the challenges that she faced in the 1960s and 70s as a lone working woman. If, if I think about the neighborhood that we were staying in and perhaps 100 households, she probably would have been the only working woman. And I still remember coming back from school in primary school when most of the times the parents, mostly mothers, would be there to receive the kids, bring them home, serve them meal. I, me and my brother would be warming up our foods and serving it to our grandparents and, and also ourselves. And I would regularly ask her, why can't she also be at home? Because that was just the context of what I was surrounded by. And only later on in my life, I understood the, how independent, how progressive, and how fulfilling her life was based on what she had committed herself to do. Now, when I think back to the opportunities that she could have had if she had more tools available to be more productive, like you have today with technology, I can't even imagine what she would have achieved and accomplished, mm. uh, in addition to obviously I mean, bringing me up and my brother up. And I say that from the context of something that, that was mentioned earlier uh, by Linda Way also, that I think there is a real need uh, for organizations, institutions, governments to take very deliberate action to address this, because I worry that left to itself, technology is only going to make it more difficult to get to gender equality. And I, I'll give you a few examples to your question um, earlier, Jason, about what can we do. Um, a, education, we have to do the future-proofing piece as we've, we've belabored on. I think there's a lot of other needs uh, for technology to focus on. Uh, take, for example, if we know that future of workplace is going to be more entrepreneurs, how likely is it for those entrepreneurs to be women if you do not have the right environment? Uh, there are about a billion women right now who don't even have a bank account. Just think about that, one billion women who don't even have a bank account. And as an entrepreneur, if you're going to set up a business, you have to secure financing, where are they going to get the tools and the technology to be able to help that uh, accomplish? It's a massive business opportunities for progressive companies who enable that infrastructure, but it does require encouragement from a public-private uh, partnership point of view. Uh, I'll, I'll say similarly, when we talk about smart cities, we have to rethink the fact that the future of work is going to be very different from the past of the work because there's probably going to be more flexible working, there's probably going to be more remote working. You also have to think about how do you create those role models uh, within institutions and also in, in nations so people can aspire to. And the last point I'll, I'll make to, to the point that was made earlier is that there is a very real risk of stereotyping and just transporting jobs that existed in the, in the previous generation into the new world. And hence, it is not by accident when you think about your handphones, most of the times that the personal assistant, the voice that comes out is a female voice. Mm. Why is that? Because uh, it might be because people think it's more compassionate, but I think it's also stereotyping. And I think we are training the future generations also to think about these things in a very different way. And we've got to now bring in the women at the design of technology itself, which is the point being made, and not think about them just as users of technology. We have to engage them when we start constructing this, because then they will create something which would be relevant for the entirety of mankind and not just for, for a part of, of the mankind. Thank you. I think we, um, we had a question um, up here. Here's a microphone. Can you... So this is probably a bit of a blunt question, um, but uh, hopefully it will engender some discussion around the panel. What are your thoughts, given everything that you've shared with us, on quotas versus targets, if we're talking about solutions? 
I'm not saying I prefer one or the other, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. You want to have a go at that? So I'll, I'll, I'll be very happy to, to take a go at it. Um, in the past, I, I was not very sure, but increasingly the more I think about it, I, I, I'm firmly convinced that you have to start with some kind of quotas. Now, whether the quota means a hard quota or a quota means a visible commitment, we have to have a goalpost that we're working towards with a very, very deliberate focus on how you're going to accomplish it. And if you're not going to accomplish it, you've got to explain. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, regulators, exchanges, and corporations heading in that direction. Uh, and I think if you're not going to have that, there is a very real risk of that glacial pace that we talked about earlier, 170 years. Uh, it's probably not even going to get there in 170 years. Yeah, I, I used to be opposed to quotas um, for the simple reason that I, you know, I come from a country in which um, our ruling party, for example, is the oldest liberation movement on the continent. It's 100 and some years old. It's never had a female leader, but has always had a 50-50 gender parity quota system to ensure that women have equal representation in senior leadership. And I believe, just from South Africa's history, that there was a possibility that quotas forced women to compete only with other women. In other words, if you have a built-in quota at 30% or 50%, Men will never see women as their competition. They'll see them as people who exist in a, in a separate paradigm, who compete with one another, and then who come in you know, under the table and don't, as a consequence, have the same amount of power, the same amount of autonomy, and the same sense that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with men. Um, and and because politics is essentially about electoral competition. Um, and then, you know, in my political party, we never had a quota system. We had many female leaders, but in the rump of the organization, the, the, the women's representation sat at like 25, 30%. So, you know, that was, what, you know, that, that was my initial opposition to, to quotas. The data have proved me wrong. Uh, you know, the, the London School of Economics has just released, you know, the results of a study. I don't know the details, so I can't vouch for its veracity, uh, which argues that quotas are an effective way of weeding out male mediocrity. Because a lot of institutions, both political and in business and so forth, tolerate male mediocrity because just by showing up and being male, assumptions are made about your competence, the fact that you have, you know, that you were ready for the job, that you have natural leadership skills, that no one did you any favors, that you quote unquote pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. The irony being that the people who most benefit from, you know, affirmative action are men who are judged at a lower standard than women, who don't have to perform as highly as women do, and whose competence is assumed rather than something that they have to prove. So, I mean, that LSE, uh, the results of that LSE study and a lot of others which have demonstrated, you know, in the Nordic countries in Scandinavia where boards are required by law to have female uh, representation at a certain level, um, and, you know, we have similar laws in South Africa, have, have changed the representation narrative around women's role in leadership. Yes, there are, you know, there are uh, positives and negatives. Some of the, pos the negatives are that at the board level, there's a danger of having career female board members, somebody who's on multiple boards being the female quotient in multiple, and that doesn't, that doesn't amount to an expansion of women's leadership in business or in, in industry. So, I mean, I think it, we've got to walk into both scenarios with eyes wide open and recognize that you know, both scenarios have got shortcomings and they've got benefits. But I would argue that on balance, um, quotas are the way forward. And you know, my own experience of being in politics, which is something I did not expect, um, was the, the simple effects of representation of young South Africans seeing a young woman, uh, a young black South African woman you know, who looks and sounds like them, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a president who's old enough to be, quote-unquote, my father. And I mean, whatever. He could have given birth to me at some, whatever, hypothetical time in the 1980s. But in Africa, that patriarchy is strong. You know, the notion of elders as people who must be respected, of men as holders of power. And so for a lot of young South African women have said to me repeatedly that just the specter of seeing a woman on television, engaging in debate, demanding respect, owning her constitutional role, and not allowing stereotypes about the role of women in society to limit her. Even though that felt to me like something I was doing at an individual level, it had representation effects. Um, and so I think we should vouch for the benefits of quotas in terms of making that happen. But at all times, we must make sure that the notions must not be that women 
can only compete against other women, or that women were somehow brought in under the table, and as such don't have access to the same level of power, authority, responsibility as men do, because they're perceived as having earned their places. I think there's an incredibly important point embedded in that, which is, uh, regardless of how you set targets or quotas, I think you need to be incredibly uh, conscious about the extent to which your processes writ large are gendered, right? And you need to be very rigorous about saying, uh, and as much as possible, reading data to bear, to be able to say, it turns out that this particular process, right, as part of our, I'll give you an example, uh, a standard way that tech companies recruit engineers is to do a thing called a whiteboard uh, coding interview, where you stand at a whiteboard and you walk, work through a problem. And there's a bunch of research that suggested uh, it's gendered, the outcomes of this process, which aren't obviously gendered, uh, in fact, are gendered, that there's bias against women in that. And for a bunch of reasons, we, uh, but this is kind of the norm in the Valley. It's, everybody does it. Uh, and for a number of reasons, we decided to go away from it, and we found a pretty substantial spike in the number of women who were getting through our, our recruiting pipeline. And it really taught us a lesson that we need to go through every aspect of how we attract people, how we review people, how we retain people, how we train people, and bring rigor to bear. Because otherwise, what, what I believe you're going to happen is uh, you're going to get the false, you, you, you'll, you'll game the system, right? You'll get women in roles, but they won't be meaningfully in roles, right? And to the extent that quotas or targets help act as a catalyst for that investigation of your underlying process and culture, great. To the extent that it's a, a way of shirking the hard work of going through uh, you're doing the self-examination to figure out where you're introducing bias into the system, I think it's not such a great thing. Anyone else with some questions over there? Thank you. Um, well, um, you talk about the AI divide, and I remember about 10, 15 years ago, there were a lot of talks about the digital divide. So, you know, you know the world is full of uh, kind of terms, and uh, you also mentioned about those tech companies, but they are... Uh, and with the uh, development of technology, do you see any uh, opportunities that, f basically new opportunities for women? You know, I don't think uh, everyone in the world needs to know how to do AI, how to do programming. Are there new jobs to be created? Because, you know, the AI and everything is basically, it's going to make, in, to make life uh, easier, to free up people from a lot of those uh, old kind of jobs. Hmm. Thank you for the question. I think it's an excellent question. I was in the recruiting mode as an engineering professor. So, but thank you for that question. This morning when I was in, uh, listening to Premier Li Keqiang, I sat next to, to this very impressive young woman. Um, she introduced herself. And when Premier Li Keqiang was mentioning about this uh, bike sharing companies, uh, there's one that's barely a year old and uh, has already 10 million users in 100 cities. And this young woman was the founder. She is the founder of that company. Um, I have seen this, and uh, I don't know how much it made me happy. I was so happy seeing her. This is a prime example of uh, women participating in the AI economy. She doesn't do the coding. She told me, you know, she has this technical lead in her, in her company that we can meet up, but she's the founder. And she came up with the idea. She came up with the whole strategy. And uh, she's participating and leading um, part of the AI economy. Now, there's another issue, which is investment. And we are all aware that uh, uh, very, very few women-founded companies in tech are funded by VCs for the simple reason that I think is that most VCs are men and people tend to trust people who are like them. You know, I, you know, I like to recruit women similarly, right? But uh, what I'm saying is that we need to be aware of the gap. We need to be aware that um, it's harder for women to come into AI and it's even harder for them to uh, get funded. Uh, so the pipeline sort of leaks all the way. But there are opportunities, these, these new opportunities. You know, anybody can think of some innovative idea and they can start a company. She said she had a hard time getting, she didn't get any funding until C round. Imagine that. She said she had to prove that the business model worked. And I sort of, my eyes widened because I knew tons of companies. I know tons of companies that had no business model proven but got funded. But women can't get away with that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but uh, nevertheless, she persists 
and uh, nevertheless, more women can participate in the AI economy this way. I actually think uh, there's a huge opportunity. I mean, I'm aware of the irony of a white male talking about this, but um, I think if you think about where new opportunities are going to come from, they're going to come from people that have intuition about one of two things. They're going to come from people that have intuition about the technology, but they're also going to come from people that have intuition about the opportunity. And I believe passionately in the power of AI to change the world, but I think it's going to change the world in ways that are not obviously predictable by venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. They're going to come from the intuition about customer needs or human experience from people who are out in the world doing those things. And that, to me, suggests that women who are, you know, are women in, as nurses are going to think about ways of using AI in nursing that somebody who's a venture capitalist isn't going to. And then when you think about the, the evolution of many of these technical tools to open source libraries, right, you've lowered the barrier, not gone to zero, but you've lowered the barrier to bring technologies to bear. I think that we have the potential to have a, uh, an algae bloom of amazing, cool new ideas led by women. I think the big constraint, as you pointed out, is funding. And I would love to tell you that I have as much optimism about that, but I just don't. So, so, so I want to uh, add to that point and, and make a connection between this question and the previous question about the quotas, because I think uh, while there is a tremendous amount of opportunity, whether it's with AI and, and machine learning and a lot of tools coming in, the key question that faces us is, how will we ensure that there's going to be greater women representation, given the point that Pascal made right at the start, if you're getting lesser inflow into STEM programs from women, if you're finding there's not enough. And I think it, it does hence bring back that question about the quota, whether that can help to level the playing field. And, and I go back to that just simply because the tools are there. There is a lack of role modeling. There's also a very clear uh, lack of uh, tools or resources available at disposals. Because if you just think about the, the women, and particularly outside of the big cities and big countries, the access to a lot of these technology tools is very, very limited. So we've got to think about how do you deliver to them more information communication tools so that they can have connectivity to the world, they can look at internet, and they can inf educate themselves to become more, more productive in terms of how they are spending their, their, their time. And hence, um, any kind of quotas, of course, I mean, shouldn't be made an assumption of that that's going to lead to any kind of mediocrity because truth be told, like I, I would hate to be told that I'm in a job because I'm a low nation representative on a particular forum, right? Because that's not what, what gets me the credibility. However, if you look around the world, the fact that there is half the population is male and half is female, I think Darwin's theory already proves the fact that everybody is equally capable. So let's just put that to rest, that there's absolutely no reason for us to doubt their abilities. It's a question of, have people had the opportunities? And how will we create those mm. opportunities? And that's where I think quotas, even in some of the new technologies, can help to level to the playing field. It doesn't need to be forever, but it will help inject a greater amount of momentum and pace to accelerate that 170 years into something that's more near term. I think there was a question um, up here. Um, so I really fully agree with the point that was earlier raised that we will not solve this issue um, if we don't have people from both genders working on it, caring about it. And I'm very happy to see gender equality on this panel for the most part. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I guess I want to ask, how can we make this a human, a human issue and not a female issue? How can we make men feel comfortable to be advocates, motivated to be advocates, um, just like the two of you are today? So, so it's, I'm, I'm happy to respond to that. I, I referenced earlier uh, about one of the initiatives that I've been very deeply involved over the last year, which is the Male Allies chapter in Hong Kong. And some of you might be familiar with the Male Champions of Change in Australia, which, which was a similarly spirited intent. Uh, the reality is, this is a human issue. This is a, a, a issue that cuts across everybody. And, and in the early part of the discussion, we demonstrated that it impacts business performance. There is business sense to be doing this. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just that the inertia and the legacy processes within the organizations make it really hard for us to be able to progress there. And women by themselves would not be able to get to that, that stage because they are not part of the system. And it's a system that needs fixing. And that system comprises of 80 to 90 percent men. So you have to get the men to engage in it, which is why we've, we formed that Male Allies chapter. It's across industry representation 
of CEOs uh, across uh, a number of uh, companies, and they are deeply committed. Each of them have, have made personal pledges and commitments, what they are going to do within their organizations and within their spheres of influence. And I think that just as a, a role modeling from a women context is useful, role modeling from a male context also is very, very helpful because then everybody within the organization looks up to and they understand that this is the right thing to do. So I'm excited about it because I'm deeply convinced that I think if we can get 100% of the mankind behind this, we'll get there. I mean, if we can get things like shark swim off the table, there's absolutely no reason why we can't get to gender parity if, if we, people understand that it's just not cool um, not to have a parity in, at workforce. We're almost out of time, so why don't we just go ahead and just have closing statements on I thought that was an excellent question. It was a nice rounding out question in the end. Can we have some closing statements off, off that in terms of, you know, just where are we at right now, particular insights from, from this session? Um, so I, um, I see we're running out of time and I, you know, I, I wanted to sort of communicate one of my biggest fears about the fourth industrial revolution as it relates to Africa, which is that a lot of African policymakers have this expectation that um, highly labor intensive work is going to flow across the Indian Ocean from East Asia to Africa as especially Chinese workers become more skilled, um, their wages go up and so on and so forth. Um, there's, this, there's, a, there's a belief um, that we will catch that wave of lower skilled work opportunities and turn Africa into kind of the factory floor of the world. And that theory doesn't, hasn't got baked into it the reality that even in East Asia, a lot of those jobs are already becoming mechanized. And so there's a very high likelihood that that wave won't even leave East Asia, much less break on the African continent's shores. And there is no future proofing that's been baked into policymakers' thinking. There's no scenario planning about what to do if that wave never makes it over because it took too, sl it took too long, our, our workers weren't skilled enough to deal or to, to, you know, to do the work that, that ended up being replaced by, by machines. Why do I raise this point in a gender uh, panel? You know, one of the biggest risks of economic contraction, especially in a continent like Africa, which has got deep cultural norms around gender, is that uh, when there's a shortage of work, it invariably will go to men, that women will be pushed out of the economy in order to make way for men to be able to work. And there's, you know, there's a great dystopian novel, which I urge you to read by Mar Margaret Atwood, called The Handmaid's Tale. And it's about you know, what happens in a dystopian future when there are no e economic opportunities. The instinctive response is, well, the men must provide. And so women must be pushed out of the workplace. And men must you know, be able to live out their, um, you know, their lives as breadwinners. And so I really and truly believe that if we don't think about this reality you know, around the fourth industrial revolution, with, with a realistic understanding of the likelihood that that'll happen, the likelihood that there will be social pull and push factors that will force women out of the workplace if they are not adequately skilled on the one hand at the supply side and also if there is no kind of demand side policy making in government to ensure that they don't get left out of that skills development. Um, we are going to have a situation where men start to, we start to move backwards and men become um, the replacement workforce. So I'm a big believer in innovative policy tools like gender, um, gender budgeting that puts gender at the center you know, of macroeconomic policy that doesn't um, ghettoize it in women's ministries. Um, you know, I'm a big believer of making men responsible for ensuring gender parity in every, every as aspect of the economy and in society. And we have to start doing that now. We have to normalize that now so that when or if this happens, um, women are not pushed to the periphery and left out of the ability to sort of live and make livings for themselves. Thank you. Josh? I, I, guess, I, I guess my closing statement is um, I, I come at this actually curiously optimistic. I think that, uh, and, and maybe it's my own experience, but I think that as companies are more greedy for talent and where the requirements and returns to human labor rather than capital increase, as we do things that require new ways of thinking about the world, I think you're gonna see companies that take gender balance, gender parity, and other, again, other kinds of diversity seriously are gonna outperform other companies. I think that will, over time, 
uh, pan out, I think what's the obligation is to continue to, and again, maybe it's being in the valley at this particular moment, but to continue to shine the light on those companies that don't do a good job, right? There, there is enormous power in a certain kind of uh, public acknowledgement of who's doing well and who's doing not. And I think you put those two together, the, the shame of the, the publicity and the benefits from getting it right, I'm, I'm an optimist, a cautious optimist, but an optimist. Terrific. Pascal? Yeah, um, I, uh, I've learned a lot from this panel. Thank you so much. And uh, I've been thinking uh, before I came here and I've been thinking during this panel is that the very last question is how, how can we get men to be motivated to recruit women into technology? Um, so I've heard the argument from the commercial side, which is that when you have a more diverse workforce, the companies are more profitable, right? I've, I've read that. But for academia, we don't have that argument. We have not seen an argument like that. So I'm left still thinking about it, and, and, uh, and I feel that um, it seems that it's even, it, to me, academia is supposed to be more progressive than the, prog the commercial world. But in terms of gender diversity, we're really lagging behind um, the commercial world in pushing for gender divide. And, um, um, I would like to learn more from you guys how to push for that in uh, academia. Thank you, Pascal. And um, I think like Pascal, I, I've learned a lot from this panel as well. And I think if there's one insight that I had from this is that even in the fourth industrial revolution, I think um, people are in charge um, and, and we're in charge. And I think that was the overriding optimistic point um, that came out of this for me. Thank you to all of you as well. Um, would you please join me in thanking the panellists? Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us in this session. I hope you enjoy the rest of the, um, of the meeting. Thank you.